Again, let me say how good it is to see so many out worshiping with us. It seems like our number goes. Better get my little microphone. All right, now everybody can hear me again. I don't necessarily have to have a microphone for everybody to hear me, but for everybody that tuned in to us, I have to have this so that they can, can so that they can hear. And sometimes when you're eager to get up and deliver a lesson, you forget things. But as I said, it is good to see everyone out. Our number is continuing to grow each week as this virus continues to be maybe and hopefully. Uh, going behind us and we can resume our normal everyday activities that we had enjoyed for so long. Continue our studies in the book of Acts. And in chapter 8, there are many different lessons that we could look at. One would be Simon the Sorcerer who had become a Christian and had sinned with his desire and having lust in his heart to have the power of the Holy Spirit so greatly that he offered money for have that, to have that power. And you remember he was told to repent or else he would perish. I could have went that direction, and we may go back and cover that direction. But this morning I want to look at the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. As you began, and perhaps as you have studied in the book of Acts, the conversions that we have studied so far have been ones that entailed great numbers of people. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we read that there were some 3,000 that obeyed the gospel of Christ. Then we go to Acts chapter 3, and then there were about 2,000 or so on that day on Solomon's porch. And then if you look at the early part of chapter 8, the word used is multitude. I don't know how many that includes. All I know is it's more than one. It was multiple people. But as we study the book of Acts, we continue to see how those in the days of the apostles, in the early days of the church, how that they responded to the message of Jesus. And I don't know why it is now. The message was basically the same in every case. Jesus is preached. And as Jesus is preached, Many respond. But now we come to the verses beginning where our brother Costell began to read. Actually, you can go back to verse 26 to begin reading about this. Where the angel of the Lord, as we'll talk about, came to Philip. And he told him of this Ethiopian eunuch. Why the sudden shift in my mind? The question is, why the shift from multiple people to now the case of one individual. I think there are several reasons for this. Number one, I believe it goes back and it proves to us the words of Jesus when he says, what shall a man gain if he, is, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus in that passage proclaims the value of one. And so we're seeing this transition to show the power of one. And we will continue to see these events take place in the future throughout the book of Acts. But let's look at this Ethiopian eunuch who was a eunuch who had great power. He was responsible for all of the treasure of the queen of Ethiopia, Candace. And I would venture to say that she was a quite wealthy individual. And he was in charge of all that she had. And we see a very religious individual who had traveled a great distance to worship God. Now understand something because there are some people who will like to point out that this conversion is the first Gentile conversion. While that is true in one way, let us remember this eunuch would not have been going to Jerusalem to worship 
unless he had proselyted himself in becoming a Jew. So he now, although a Gentile by birth, was a Jew now because he was converted to Judaism. And so let's keep that in the back of our minds. So as we begin to look at the conversion of this man first, verse 26 down through verse 28, and I, 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 I was going to put this as plowing the passage again so that we can dig deep, but I want to notice several things about this passage as we go through. First of all, I want you to notice that Philip was sent. And yes, I realize that Philip was sent when he was sent by the angel of God. He was told to go and to preach the gospel to this individual. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, yes, in a miraculous sense. But for us today, the miraculous sense is now gone. And you and I as Christians need to understand our responsibility to share the gospel to a lost and to a dying world. And something that I noticed in verse number 28, I had always skipped right over this. Notice it says he was sitting in his chariot. I always thought maybe the chariot was traveling when Philip joined himself to it. But then the more I began to think and see this passage, it says that it was sitting. I began to wonder in my mind, was he doing like you and I would do as we were traveling? And he needed to take a break. Maybe he was getting weary from his journey. But the key is he was sitting there and he was eager to learn. We will see that in just a moment. And so here he was returning home from his worship in Jerusalem, reading from the prophet Isaiah. In verse 29, the Spirit continues to communicate with Philip. And he told Philip, go and overtake this chariot. You go and you overtake this chariot. And Philip does exactly that. Because we begin reading now down through verse 30, down through verse 35. We read that Philip preaches Jesus to him. And I want you to notice how Philip began this conversation. It is something that you and I ought to learn. And that is Philip began to teach the eunuch by asking a question. Do you understand what you are reading? Costell read from the King James Version which said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand? Do you know what you are reading? Do you know what it's talking about? A question that was asked. It is a question in my mind that was non invasive. Philip knew the right question. Brother, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be asking a similar question when we go to study with someone. Do you understand what you are studying? Are there any questions that you have that I might be able to answer for you? But you go on and you will notice the eunuch responds to his question in verse 31. He says, how can I unless someone helps me. The eunuch, I would consider him to be a wise, to be a very intelligent individual, yet he was struggling with what he was reading. And he had no fear to say, how can I unless someone helps me? Do any of you who are here this morning or watching online, what is the dumbest question that you can ask? What is the dumbest question you can ask? Well, I'll answer it for you. It's the one you don't ask. Because if you don't ask, you will not be assisted. If the eunuch had not told Philip, how can I? and asked him that question, then how would Philip have been able 
to teach and converse with them. What he is doing there is he expre is expressing to Philip, he's expressing to him his desire to learn. And notice, this is a passage that is a direct reference back to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 and verse 8, which describes one who is, will be led as a sheep to the slaughter, which describes one whose life is taken from the earth. And so the next question the eunuch asks is a very important question. Is this man talking about himself or someone else. The eunuch has now opened the door by asking Philip, is he talking about Isaiah or someone else? That opened the door for Philip to preach unto him Jesus. You continue on after you read that in verse 34, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning at this scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as the journey continued, we don't have all that is taught about Jesus. We don't have a record of everything that was said. All I know is that he preached to him Jesus. And as he preached to him about Jesus, Notice what the eunuch's next question is. Questions asked equals questions answered, which gives us the knowledge we need. The eunuch goes on in verse 36. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? What is going to prevent me from being baptized? Brother, that is a direct emphasis that preaching Jesus is preaching about baptism. In the bulletin today, there is an article. It's entitled, The ABCs of Water Baptism. A great article that I was able to secure and to find. But as I think about the unit being baptized, Philip then replies, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There the eunuch makes the good confession of who Jesus is. And so verse 38 down through verse 40, Philip baptizes the eunuch. Stopping the chariot. And we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about these things as we go further in our lesson. But you notice the chariot was stopped. And it says that both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And then Philip baptizes him. When they come up out of the water, the Spirit of God catches Philip and leads him away. And what happens to the eunuch? He goes on his way rejoicing. And so, point number two in our lesson deals with some observations from this passage. And these are not just observations, these are truths from this passage. Number one, the prospects for the gospel. Who is a prospect to obey the gospel? That ought to be a question we ask ourselves. Who is a prospective Christian? Our answer? Our answer should be all we come in contact with. Whether rich or poor, whether healthy or in poor health, no matter what it is, everyone needs to be taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, this emphasizes back to me 
the importance of one. And who is responsible to teach the one? Philip on this occasion, but it is our responsibility on the occasions that we have. Here's a man of Ethiopia. Obviously, he was a religious man. He had some knowledge about who God was. He had some knowledge of the Old Testament. But we read of him struggling to understand that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. He was reading from the Scripture. He had a desire to know in fact, if you go through the book of Acts, would you not agree with me that most of the individuals and the conversions that are recorded were recorded about individuals who were devout, who had some religious background? Yes. Think about the 3,000 on Pentecost. They obviously showed that they were religious because they had traveled to Jerusalem to what? Celebrate. The Passover. Or how about we go a little bit further ahead, and I'll cheat ahead a little bit. How about in Acts chapter 10, where we begin to read about a young man named Cornelius. Would you agree with me that Cornelius was a devout individual? It says that he prayed and he offered alms. He was a religious person. And you can continue to go through the others, if you will. A little bit later, we're going to look at the, the, uh, the persecutor Saul, who was a zealous individual. But he was zealous for the old law until he was converted. Lydia, a woman who met every Sabbath day to pray with others. And so from these thoughts, we can glean the following. Just because one is religious does not equate to their salvation. Did you get that? One can be very religious, but that doesn't mean that they are assured of salvation. In the three cases when we think about, or the four cases, if you will, when you think about the unit, you think about Saul, you think about Cornelius, and you think about Lydia. Were they saved in the state that they were in? No. But they were devout in what they believed. It teaches us that religious individuals, folks who are devout, who have some understanding, but maybe as the eunuch had a misunderstanding, they just need guidance so that they can be brought to the truth. You see, many already fear God. Many already respect His authority. But they need to be shown just as Apollos was, Apollos was shown the way of the Lord more accurately. Those that are truly seeking our job is to provide the opportunity for them to see the truth of God's Word. But a second thought goes back to when Philip began at that same scripture in verse 35 and preached to him Jesus. When you go back and you think about what the eunuch had been reading in Isaiah 53, what does it mean to preach Jesus? We know that it involves preaching how Jesus died for our sins. We also know that it means how Jesus had been exalted by God. We have examples of Jesus being exalted by His Father in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and verse 31. We also have other passages that it teaches us in the exaltation of Christ where it says there is no other name under heaven by which salvation exists or can be obtained. And then we go on 
In preaching Jesus involves the eunuch's question in verse 36. What hinders me from being baptized? I suggest to you that included in Philip's teaching, he included that the eunuch must be baptized. That is not some guess that I'm making. That is some logical conclusion that you have to be able to make when you see his question. I believe that Philip told him the words of Jesus from Mark chapter 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He may not have said it in those exact words, but I guarantee that he said that one must be baptized to be saved. I believe he also expressed the purpose of baptism. What is the purpose of baptism? The purpose of baptism is twofold. Number one, we read in Acts chapter 2 that baptism is for what? The remission of sins. That we might be cleansed of our sins. But a second thing about baptism when it occurs, also in Acts chapter 2, down around uh, maybe verse 47, we read that when one is baptized, the Bible says that the Lord adds them to the church. And He does it daily. So baptism serves two purposes. One, remission of sins. Two, for the Lord to add you to His church. But also in this idea of the question, what hinders me from being baptized, I have to point out, as many of our religious friends are in error on this point, the question that he asked shows the importance of immediate baptism. Someone says, Brother Ray, what do you mean? Why didn't the eunuch ask Philip, how long do I need to wait? Can, I, can we wait till I get back home to be baptized? That wasn't his question. What hinders me? What's keeping me from being baptized this very minute? Baptism is something that needs to be done as soon as you have heard the Word preached, you've developed faith in the Word, You've been willing to leave the past way of sin, begin to live the way of God. We call that what? Repentance. That you are willing to make the good confession that the eunuch made. And when you see the need, you are baptized immediately. Not wait a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it may be. Whenever there's enough, Chip, is what I hear. We don't want to baptize anybody until we have a group of individuals. I don't know about you. I'd rather spend an extra 20 minutes every Sunday being a witness to an individual being baptized into Christ than getting to the restaurant or getting home to eat lunch early. I don't know about you. That's just me. What a joy and what a thrill it is to see an individual immerse for the remission of their sins and to become a member of the Lord's church. There's no greater thing in this world. He asked because he knew that it needed to be done. <coughs> Philip gave him the requirement that he needed to believe in who Jesus is, and he immediately responded that he believed. But let's talk about baptism real quick. Because there is such a misunderstanding of what baptism is. Baptism, we know, involves water. When the eunuch was baptized, you notice it says that they both went down into the water. 
I will challenge anybody here, anybody watching, I will challenge you to show me how two people can fit into an eight ounce glass of water. Is that possible, Chip? Is it possible for two grown human beings to fit into an eight ounce glass of water? Brother Ray, you're just being absurd. No, I'm not. I'm trying to illustrate to you that baptism requires, as it did in the day when Jesus was baptized, it says there needed to be much water. That word much means a great quantity. Illustrated here tells me, Brother Gerald, that there was enough water for Philip and the eunuch to go down into and for Philip to baptize the eunuch. Great deal of water, which eliminates sprinkling, which eliminates pouring of water as a form of baptism. And the reason that is is because our good brother Paul, a little bit later in his ministry in Romans chapter 6, he says, do you not know when you are baptized, you are baptized into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6. And I know time is slipping away. But how many of us have been to a cemetery and we've only seen one shovel full of dirt put on top of a casket when one is buried? You shaking your head? No? Never seen that? I hadn't either. Brethren, when we understand that baptism is a burial, we understand that it means to be completely immersed in the water. Perhaps the eunuch could have had the, the, the attitude, why get wet? All he needs is a handful of water. But that wasn't his attitude. You see, we've already said, baptism is described as a burial. Jesus preached. Questions answered. Ended up in this eunuch being baptized and converted to Christ. So as we close our thoughts this morning, I believe with the conversion of this Ethiopian eunuch, we can understand and be impressed by the simplicity of salvation. God has made understanding what it means to be saved very simple. Man is who has complicated salvation, not God. And so when you and I have the true and the same attitude of this man, we can see that even after just one lesson about Jesus, one can become a Christian. We see that the gospel of Jesus was truly preached. And the death of Jesus for our sins will be stressed. Someone here may be asking themselves the question, Brother Ray, what hinders me from being baptized? I can only answer that question in one way. The only hindrance to you being baptized is you not willing to commit to being obedient to the Word of God. It all falls back on your shoulders. It all falls back on what you're willing to do. Are you willing to do what the eunuch did? Are you willing to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and will you be baptized this morning? I've been wanting to do this for a while. For a while. See, here is water. What hinders you?
from being baptized. You can do that today. Or if you are a member of the body of Christ and you've turned your back on the Lord and on His church, you can come today with a heart that's willing to repent of the sin that exists in your life. Confess those sins before this assembly, before the God of heaven. And you can be forgiven again. Will you let your brethren pray with you, pray for you? Our hope and our goal is to help each other get to heaven. We can assist you in whatever your need may be, but only if you will come. Make your need known and do that while we stand and while we sing.